greet each one of you again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that you have chosen again this Sunday to join us in worship of God online. I have several psalms that are my favorites. One of my absolutely favorite psalms is Psalm 34. Listen as I read the first eight verses of this psalm. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around about those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. As this psalm points out, God's people are to bless or adore him at all times. His praise is always to be on our lips. As God's people, we are given the privilege of exalting God's, God's name together. And we're to continually call out to our Lord as we wait upon him to save us out of all of our troubles. We're to take consolation the fact that our Lord encamps around about us, and he delivers us from the many afflictions of this life. We're to daily choose to observe the goodness of the Lord and to take refuge in him. Shall we pray? Our precious Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all of our praise and adoration because you alone are our God. You're the source of all of our blessings. From the tangible blessings of food and clothing and health to all the spiritual riches that we enjoy in Christ, we praise you for all that you do for us each and every day of our life. Thank you for the great miracle of your salvation when your Son came into this world to purchase our redemption. Thank you for reaching down into this world to bring us back to yourself. Thank you for giving us the capacity to be able to express our worship to you. We would ask that each one of us would humble ourselves before you in praise and adoration. May you receive unto yourself the praise and worship that is due to you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I realize that while many do not have hymn books or choruses to sing from, I've attempted to pick out another hymn this morning that we should all know by memory. Please sing with me the old time hymn, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement from sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. While we're still limited in our social interaction with one another, I trust that we're utilizing our phones 
in the upcoming weeks that lie before us to keep in touch with each other. I would again remind you that the 2020 church address list can be used so that we can verbally and personally keep in contact with each other. And I'll also remind you that even though we cannot gather in assembly, that our church still needs to pay its bills. In addition to the church address containing the names of most of our church families, it also contains the church's mailing address. Now, I realize we cannot gather to collect our tithes and offerings. The trustees are asking God's people to mail their tithes and offerings to the church's address. As a church, we want to maintain absolute transparency in our giving and in how our church is functioning financially. If our congregation continues to faithfully give toward the church, we will be able to meet our adopted 2020 budget and be able to continue the support of our three missionary families. Our church address is Calvary Baptist Church of, of Sullivan County, Box 621, Neversink, New York, 12765. I'd again remind you that giving to God's church is indeed an act of worship on our part. Shall we pray as we ask the Lord's blessing upon what we will give to him. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with all that we have. Thank you for, that you daily provide for every one of our needs. And we are looking to you as a congregation of God's people to provide for the needs of our church. May our attitude in giving be joyful and voluntary. May we give to you with cheerfulness in our hearts. And that we take the extra step in giving by mailing our gifts of worship unto you to see fit that until we can meet again in a gathering of worship. We thank you in advance for what you would do as we yield ourselves to you in the area of giving. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to extend our worship before you through our tithes and offerings. May you continue to bless your church as your people provide for the needs of your ministry. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In preparation for this morning's sermon, please uh, get out your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 14. Before sharing the Word of God with you, I briefly want to highlight a few announcements. The various gatherings of our church will resume just as soon as the coronavirus restrictions are lifted and the virus is contained. I'm going to do everything in my power to provide a brief devotional midweek, which can be accessed through the church's Facebook and YouTube. And during that time, I'll be highlighting the prayer requests that our church families have uh, forwarded to Lyle and Lisa's. Lord willing, we will be holding our Good Friday service on Friday, April 10th at the church at 7 p.m. and a Resurrection Morning worship service on Sunday, April 12th, providing, of course, the coronavirus restrictions are lifted. Being confined or feeling restricted in some way is not something that most people enjoy. Growing up, I came to discover that my mom absolutely hated riding in elevators. Her fear of elevators were deepened if the elevators that she was riding on was full of people. You could actually see the anxiety on her face. As we all know, because New York State is the epicenter of the coronavirus in America, many people in our state are feeling confined. We're not supposed to be out among people. We're to remain confined in our homes unless of course, uh, we need to get food or traveling to a job that's essential by declared essential by the state. In an attempt to spread the to stop the spread of the coronavirus, Governor Andrew Cuomo is seeking to confine people to their homes and have all unnecessary businesses to temporarily close down. This has been really difficult for some people. Some people are used to continually running from sun up to sundown. Now these folks are being forced to confine themselves to their homes. Like a caged in animal in a zoo, these people can't wait until the day when these restrictions are, re are removed. Many folks feel like a boa constrictor is wrapped around their lives and are squishing all the fun out of their lives. But sometimes God chooses to confine or to restrict people's lives. 
Several times most winters in Sullivan County, we experience major snowstorms, and our governor closes down some of the major highways to prevent accidents. This time, it's not a snowstorm that's confining us. This time, we're being confined in an attempt to, spread, to stop the spread of a deadly coronavirus. In this sermon, I'd like to look with you at how an entire nation handled feeling confined by their circumstances. In today's text from Exodus chapter 14, the children of Israel were confined. They had the Red Sea in front of them, they had mountains on both sides, and they had Pharaoh and the Egyptian army behind them. They were hemmed in on all sides. What lessons can we learn about how we should handle ourselves when we are confined by life's crisis? That question is answered in Exodus chapter 14. Last week I began a series I've entitled, The God Who Rescues. I've entitled this morning's message, Confined for a Purpose. When we're restricted in our activities, we find ourselves asking the question, why? Why is God allowing the coronavirus to confine us? Why are we not allowed to be with other people? We all know the reason we're being confined to stop the spread of the coronavirus. When God confines or restricts our lives, he has a purpose behind doing so. In Exodus chapter 14, we learn many lessons about both God and ourselves when we find ourselves confined or restricted in life's crisis. In this chapter of God's word, the Israelites had finally been delivered from their bondage in Egypt. God had brought about ten different plagues upon the nation of Egypt before Pharaoh finally allowed the Israelites to leave his land. But no sooner had they left the land of Egypt when God directed them to camp by the Red Sea. In this chapter, we're told that Pharaoh changed his mind. He wanted his slaves back. He missed his free workforce. And so what did Pharaoh do? Exodus 14, 7 reads, He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all them, and he pursued the Israelites. Well, just as soon as the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming after them, they did three things. Number one, they were terrified. Number two, they cried out to God. And number three, they blamed their leader for the mess that they were in. If you're following along in your Bibles, please notice with me Exodus 14, verses 10 to 12, which reads, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to this desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out, up out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Just like so many people in America today are blaming President Donald Trump for the coronavirus outbreak and for not correctly handling the economic crisis that this outbreak is causing, the Israelites were blaming Moses for leading them into this situation, the Red Sea, when in reality it was God that led them there. Even though the Senate has passed a $2 trillion stimulus package, the front headlines on Thursday's Middletown Record newspaper said this, Cuomo rips $2 trillion stimulus package. The article went on to say that New York is not getting enough federal aid. Whenever anything goes wrong, people automatically want to blame their leaders for this crisis. This is not a new situation that leaders are facing today. Moses at that point encouraged the people, and, and God encouraged him to raise his staff over the Red Sea and the waters parted. But God did not stop there. The angel of God, who was Jesus, before he added his human body in the little town of Bethlehem, withdrew from leading Israel's army and went behind the Israelites to protect them from attack from the Egyptians. And we all know the rest of the story. The Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry, gap, dry ground, but when the Egyptians followed them into the Red Sea, God caused the water of the Red Sea to come back upon them. That's Exodus 14 in a nutshell. But in the remainder of our time, I'd like to highlight four lessons 
that we can all learn from the crisis that the Israelites faced at the Red Sea. Lesson number one can be seen in Exodus 14, verses 1 to 4. These verses read, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pihah Rero, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Siphon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering up around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Lesson number one I want you to note it from these verses is that God has a purpose behind the crisis that he allows to come into our lives. In verse 4, God shared with us two reasons why he brought about the crisis at the Red Sea. Number one, God brought the crisis about to gain glory for himself through the destruction of Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. God will re even receive glory from the destruction of the people who have set themselves up against him in opposition. God was glorified through the destruction of Pharaoh and the Egyptian army who were out to re-enslave God's people again. The destruction of the Egyptians pointed forward to a coming day when even a greater army will gather to try to prevent Jesus from returning in glory. At the Battle of Armageddon, the armies of the world will be defeated as every knee will bow before Christ and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God brought this crisis of in the Red Sea about to gain glory for himself. Secondly, God brought this crisis about so the Egyptians would know that he was Lord. When God commanded Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, we're told in Exodus 5 verse 2 that Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Through the ten plagues that God brought upon the Egyptian nation, and through the drowning of Pharaoh's army, all the Egyptians would know that God is the Lord. Each of the ten plagues upon the nation Egypt was to display God's power over the idols that the Egyptians worshipped. But through the drowning of the Egyptian army, all the Egyptians that were left alive would know that God is the Lord. The coronavirus is reminding this world's people once again that God is the Lord. People are not in control of this world. The Egyptians did not know that God was the Lord. Many of the people in our world today no longer recognize and come under the authority that God is the Lord. Many of these people think that they're in authority over this world. But when these people face a disease that has killed thousands of people throughout the world, they're forced to come to grips that it is God and not man that is in control of this world. God's purposes behind bringing about this crisis is repeated in Exodus chapter 14, verses 17 and 18. These verses read, I, that is God, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Lesson number one, God has a purpose behind the crisis that he allows to come into our lives. Now, I will not tell you that I know for sure the purpose behind why God has allowed the coronavirus to come upon this world's people. I do believe that God is trying to turn the hearts of people back to himself through this disease. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 to 15 reads, When I, that is God, shut up the heavens so that there is no more rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. God has a purpose.
behind every crisis that we go through, that purpose may very well be to turn the hearts of people back to himself. While none of us can say with any degree of certainty why God has brought about this crisis, we do know that God has a purpose behind whatever it is that he brings about in his world and inside our lives. Lesson number two I want to point out comes out of Exodus 14, verse 10. Exodus 14, 10 reads, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Lesson number two, when God's people are facing crisis, we need to cry out to God in prayer. We can only imagine the depths of the fear that the Israelites experienced when they saw the Egyptian soldiers coming after them. These people must have been absolutely terrified when they saw the Egyptian armies behind them. Verse 15 tells us that even Moses was crying out to the Lord. Exodus 14, 15 reads, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. It's a natural response for followers of Christ to cry out to God in prayer in the midst of life's crises. There are many times in this life that we face crisis. Sometimes those crises relate to our jobs. Sometimes they relate to our relationships with others. Sometimes our crises relate to our health, while at other times they relate to our finances. Regardless of the severity, regardless of the duration, Regardless of the nature of our crisis that we are facing, we all need to cry out to God in prayer in the midst of our crisis. Just listen to the following verses. 1 Peter 5, 7 reads, Cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Philippians 4, 7, 4 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Psalm 55, 22 reads, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. When God's people are facing crisis, we need to cry out to him in prayer. The Bible is filled with examples of believers who face crisis in their lives and how they cried out to God in the midst of their crisis. In Exodus 15, verse 25, we're told that when the Israelites had traveled into the desert with no water for three days, that they came upon the waters of Marah, and the water was polluted, undrinkable. Exodus 15, 25 says that Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, that when he threw it into the water, that the water became sweet. Joshua 24, 7 says, when the Israelites cried to the Lord for help, that he put darkness between them and the Egyptians, and he brought the sea over them and covered them. Judges 3 verse 9 says, But they cried out to the Lord, and he raised up for them a deliverer. Judges chapter 3 verse 15 says, Again the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer. When the Philistines were attacking the Israelites, we're told in 1 Samuel 7 verse 9, When Samuel cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, the Lord answered him. Nehemiah 9, 27 says, When they, the, that is the Israelites, were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them, and in your great compassion you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hands of their enemies. Just listen to some of the statements that the psalmist made in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 30, verse 2, it reads, O Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. Psalm 34, 6 reads, This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. Psalm 107, verse 6 says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distresses. That phrase is repeated in verses 13 and 19 of the same psalm. Psalm 118, 5 says, In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. And Psalm 120, verse 1 says, I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. When God's people are facing crisis, we need to cry out unto God in prayer. 
Just listen to the following chorus that it's entitled, The Cares Chorus. It goes, I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. In the midst of the coronavirus, God's people need to cry out to him in prayer. Lesson number three comes from Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. Exodus 14, 13 and 14 reads, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Lesson number three. When God's people are facing crisis, we need to stand firm in our faith and look to God to deliver us from our crisis. When Moses was blamed by the Israelites for bringing about their crisis, he did not lash out at them. He did not seek to defend himself and his actions. Moses simply gave the Israelites three commands from God. Number one, they were not to be afraid. Number two, they were to stand firm and watch God deliver them. And number three, they were to be still and wait for God to intervene for them. When life's crisis come upon us, we as followers of Christ need to obey these same three commands from God. Number one, we need to not allow our fears to control us. Number two, we need to stand firm in our faith and watch God deliver us. And number three, we need to be still and wait upon God to intervene for us. I'm not saying that we should not take the necessary precaution for this confinement of this virus. I'm not saying that we should not get a couple extra rolls of toilet paper and some hand sanitizers. But what I am saying is that we should not hustle about running here and there exhausting ourselves. We need to be still and wait upon God to intervene for us. We need to wait upon God to deliver us from the coronavirus epidemic. Psalm chapter 46 verse 10 reads, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This psalm was written when King Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem were surrounded by 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. As King Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem were confined by the enemy, God told them to be still and to know that he is their God. When God's people are facing crisis, we need to stand firm in our faith and look to God to deliver us from our crisis. And lesson number four comes out of Exodus 14, verses 30 and 31, which reads, That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Egyptians saw, when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses his servant. Lesson number four, when God brings about deliverance from our crisis, we need to see his great power and revere and trust him more. When God in his great mercy brings about a deliverance to this world's people from the coronavirus, we need to see his great power, and we need to revere and trust him all the more. Each one of us are looking forward to that day when the spread of the coronavirus will stop. Many of this world's people are seeking to give the credit to the ending of this epidemic to the world's medical scientists and experts. But as followers of the living God, we know who it is that provides us deliverance from life's crisis. It's God that will grant to this world scientists the expertise and wisdom to be able to bring a cure to this epidemic. Even as I speak, God is displaying his great power by entrusting to human beings the wisdom that they need to bring about a cure for this epidemic. And when that happens, it will not be man that will get the credit. It will be a breakthrough for God. When God brings about deliverance from this crisis, See the great power that God has unleashed and fear and reverence him and continue to grow in your relationship with God. Are you feeling confined by the coronavirus? 
Are you feeling like the Israelites must have felt when they were hemmed in by the Red Sea? In the midst of the coronavirus, do not forget these four major lessons from Exodus 14. Lesson number one, God has a purpose behind the crisis that he allows to come into our lives. Number two, when God's people are facing crisis, we need to cry out to him in prayer. Number three, when God's people are facing crisis, stand firm in your faith and look to God. And lesson number four, when God brings about deliverance from our crisis, we need to see his great power and revere and trust him more. In the midst of being confined, rest assured, God has a purpose for this trial. Cry out to God in prayer, stand firm in your faith, and keep increasing in your respect and trust in the Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer, followed by singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder that each one of us, that we all need to have an understanding that you have a purpose behind everything that you allow to enter into your world. Even as you deliver the Israelite from their bondage to the Egyptians, and even as you deliver... Even, you will continue to deliver your people today. Thank you in advance for what you will do in and through this situation. May each one of us stand firm in our faith and keep our eyes upon you this morning. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's sing together the little chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus, the first and third stanza. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Well, you'll decide now to follow Jesus. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Lord willing, we will be sharing God's word with you in the middle of this week and again next week, next Sunday on YouTube and Facebook. We are dismissed.